Hey y'all, how are you today? I hope it's another great day for you. It is a good day for me. I mean, I'm alive and I have every reason to be joyful. And I hope you do have every reason to be joyful as well. And if you're not, you know what, cheer up. There's still a few more hours left in the day and um, whatever is ailing you, I do hope you will be okay in the end. I do pray so. And um, before we start, I'd like to um, pay homage to um, a lady whom many people call, the world over called her Madam Secretary. And I'm wearing this pin, I don't usually wear pins, but I have a few. I'm wearing this pin in honor of Madeline Jana Corbell Albright. She lived from 15 May. 1937 and she passed yesterday 23rd march 2022 she was the 64th secretary of state in the united states of america from 1997 to 2001 and she served under president bill clinton she was more importantly the first female secretary of state in the u.s history and then um, she was the originator of the diplomacy of the pin. That's it there. You know, she used it to um, diffuse many situations and for conversation starters. And that's uh, about the list of what she, could, she, she, she brought to the world, you know. So Madeline, Jana, Cobell, Albright, we salute you. We honor your memory. Thank you for breaking the bias. Rest in peace. And I will pray comfort for those who love you and remember you. We will continue to discuss breaking the bias. Hi, Asin. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining Unplugged this morning. Thank you very much. Today, we are going to talk about, um, what is our topic for today? Walking in power. Hmm. I wish I'd actually captioned it, how far can you go without legs? Because it was a question that came afterwards. Now, how far can you go without legs? The natural answer will be uh, not very far indeed, but um, we're here to prove otherwise. This week, our guest is somebody whose book I first read um, about three or four years ago. And after I read it, I spoke to the publisher, who was my friend, and I said, is this a real person? Is this fiction? And she said, no, it's not fiction. It's a real person. I'm like, okay, I'd like to meet her. And like that, I I met her at a faith-based gathering of women called Sister Power Gathering. We made an instant connection. And um, today she's here to answer the question, how far can you go without legs? Please welcome with me my friend, my sister and someone I greatly admire and I'm inspired by, Irene Titilola Olumese. Welcome, sis. Good morning. How are we you? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Very well, thank you. Great. Hi, Geraldine. <laughs> Hi, Afyong. Welcome, everybody. So we're going to take a minute and go on Instagram. So our friends and family there can also join us. So give us a minute. I'm trying not to be, I'm trying not to be too sloppy about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the connection has been pretty rough for the past three days here in um, Port Harcourt. So we are praying that it holds out. Yes, okay. Sis, I've sent you the invitation. Okay. <laughs> All right. Voila. So there we are. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Great. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. So today I thought that we we would do this. Um, kind of, not on the fly, but on the fly. First of all, I'd like 
You guys who look on Instagram, this book. <laughs> Grace in the storm. That was the book I wrote, I read. And um, I could not believe that it was a human being had gone through all of this and survived. So sis, I'm gonna ask you, first of all, you are a long transplant survivor. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, bilateral amputee. <laughs> but before then, you had lived 20 years of your life mm -hmm. with, with bronchial tersis. I took time to try and listen to, to pronounce that, but please help me pronounce that. <laughs> Bronchestasis. <laughs> Bronchestasis. Okay. Bronchestasis. Yes. Now, I did a little research and I realized that it's a very rare uh, ailment. And in Nigeria, as far as I know, it's about 100, only 100,000 people per year, cases per year that we see in Nigeria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's very rare. Yeah, the, yes. audio, is the audio is um, it's echoing. Um, how do I prevent that on okay let me see okay i've stopped it on yeah okay good yeah it shouldn't echo anymore i have okay muted now, it on ig yes okay i can still hear my voice let's try it again. can you can you hear me without any of these things please just say yes if you can hear me I'm wondering how I can prevent the voice from IG from getting in here as well. Oh, um, I think you're supposed to put, um, put an earpiece underneath in the port underneath. Ah, okay, I get it. Okay, great. <laughs> Let me do that. Because <laughs> I was wondering. Uh, Okay, give me a minute. Let me do that quickly. Okay. Aha. Okay, done that. <laughs> All right, are we good? We're good. Let me try my earpiece again <laughs> and see how this rolls. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? The yes, echo is gone. Yeah. Oh, it's gone. Great, great. Yeah. Praise it's God. Gone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was a bit worried about that echo, so we yes, are good yes, now. Yes, uh, we had the echo last week as well. And I, I was like, oh, no, we have to solve this echo issue. <laughs> we can't have it. <laughs> I've learned something new today <laughs> with this technology. <laughs> well, thank goodness for millennials and Gen Zs. I mean, they help us. They help us. We thank God for them. We thank God for yes. them. <laughs> yes. Voila. Okay. okay. So when I told her, Yusi, Yusi is my colleague, when I told yes. her about this book, right? And I told her a yes. little bit about it. And she said, I asked her, do you have any questions you'd like to ask um, yes. Irene? And she said, her story just sounds like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Like, I don't know what to ask. Her story sounds like a movie. So let me go beyond. Let me let me help her as best as I can. But I know I know she yeah. has a question, so she'll put it here. You know, you're not a label. 
I want to go beyond the labels. You're not the label. Mm -hmm. You're not. Um, you're not. These things happen to you, but they are not you. No, no. You know? <laughs> but I think um, some of us still have that. Um, forgive me, morbid curiosity about how did you come to be a lung transplant survivor? I mean, before I read your book, I never even knew you could do a lung transplant. I, I just didn't know that. T take, us a little, take us back a little bit about um, to when you started experiencing this persistent cough and then walk us through to that theater room. Okay. Um... It's a bit of a, okay, let me see how quickly I can summarize it. I think the first indication that something was wrong um, was in um, 1990. I went for an x-ray. Um, I was preparing to go to Canada for my, um, for a student, um, for my PhD student exchange, right? And um, my doctor said they noticed um, a shadow. But um, they investigated it. It didn't look like anything that was going to give us any concern. And so I got my clearance and I went to Canada. And I didn't pay any attention to it again since nothing went wrong. So fast forward to 1993. I started the year with the loss of my baby. My pregnancy, 32 weeks old pregnancy, ended and is still bad. And I was wondering what was going on here. But in the midst of all of that, I got this job with the UNICEF that required me to do a full medical exam before my position is rectified. You know, I got all the uh, three level clearance that we have to have in Nigeria, in the regional office and then headquarters required medical clearance. So I went to do the medical clearance and um, I think just before I did the medical clearance, I started coughing. I had gone for the training. It was April, 1993. Easter, precisely, and it was a good Friday, this cough started in Kaduna. And I was wondering what exactly was going on. So I thought just an ordinary cough, go back to Lagos, go back to Ibado. The cough did not go. Then shortly after that, I had to go for medical clearance. Long and short, they, um, at the X-ray, they found something that was more definite now compared to um, 1990. I remembered when I finished that... Um, S3, the, the technician went to call the doctor. The doctor called another doctor. And I was sitting down there. I was seeing them going in and out, you know, checking and coming back and looking at me, then going in and come back again. I look at me. Eventually, they gave me the report in a sealed envelope. Of course, you can't give me anything in a sealed envelope. I live in the medical community. I opened it and I saw a new resume of their heart. I mean, my heart just went out of my mouth. And what exactly is this? So I took it home. My husband said, no. They can't say that until further investigation. So we did a further investigation. It was definitely something was there. So my doctor said, we will have a bronchoscopy. When we go in, we'll see what is there. If it is necessary, we'll go straight to surgery. We won't just bring you out of um, anesthesia. We will just go straight to surgery. And that was what they did. They did a bronchoscopy and they had to go straight to surgery. So when I woke up, I was told that they brought out a cyst the size of my fist from between my heart and my lungs. So it wasn't in my lungs. It wasn't in my heart. It was lying in between. So it was a tumor, but it was a benign tumor. And so we thought, okay, we got rid of whatever this was and life goes on. <laughs> no, cough did not stop. And then over the next year, a plethora of symptoms started appearing. First, I started having drooping eyes, allergy of unknown or you know of unknown origin and it was just one thing after the other for the next five years it was in 1998 that they made a definitive diagnosis of myasthenia gravis and bronchiectasis bronchiectasis is the an inability of the lungs to evacuate the yeah, all of us get fluids i mean going round around but i couldn't bring evacuate it properly so it was settling in and creating a, a perfect environment for infection. Yeah. So that was why the cough. How that started, we really still don't know, but it obviously with the, um, whatever it is that let the cyst grow in, must have also initiated that as well. So now I'm dealing with two major uh, medical pathology <laughs> and um, I couldn't believe what they told me. So I had to go for a second opinion in US, Ohio Medical Center, 
And they told me exactly the same thing my doctors in UCH told me, bronchiectasis and myasthenia gravis. And they told me that within the next five years, um, depending on the rapidity of the progression of the disease, that I will be in a wheelchair, I will not be able to do my daily activities. <laughs> I think by this time, my husband and I, we've gotten to the point where every time we hear doctor's report, the first thing he's going to say to me is, whose report are you going to believe? And I will respond, I will believe the report of the Lord. And um, his report says, I am healed, and that's all that. We, we do all of that. But really, at that point, I could have to make a choice. Am I going to exist or am I going to leave? Because with this diagnosis, I really didn't know where life was going. But I chose that I was going to live and live well. And my friends asked me to stay back in the United States. I, mean, I, said, I can't stay back in the United States. I don't have a job here. I have a medical issue that's going to require a, a, a medical insurance, and I couldn't stay. So and my husband also said, God did not tell him to move to U.S. <laughs> so we, 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 <laughs> And I wasn't going to stay in U.S. without my husband or my children. So since I had a good, I mean, I had a good job, that had medical uh, um, insurance to go with it. And I knew I could come to US whenever I wanted to get second opinion and to continue my way. So I, I packed my whole medication. I returned back to Nigeria, I returned to work. And that was it. I continued to leave <laughs> until um, 2003. At this time, I mean, I had moved from Ibadan to Lagos, still working with the organization, and then from Lagos to Ghana. And when I got to Ghana, I was posted to the northern part of Ghana. It's like being posted from Lagos to Meiduguri. <laughs> so, I mean, dusty, yeah. <laughs> dusty, hot, and my work was really stressful. It was travel intensive. I had to oscillate between Accra and this um, and Tamale. And sometimes it's about 11 hours by road, right? Mm -hmm. And the flight then was not very regular. So I was really doing a lot of traveling back and forth. Two years into Ghana, my lungs collapsed in Tamale. And this had now become an emergency because there was they didn't have the facility to take care of it in Tamale. They couldn't put me on the plane. Um, Wagadugu said they shouldn't bring me because Wagadugu was about five hours away that they didn't have a um, medical facility to take me. So they put me in an ambulance, no oxygen, no air conditioner, and took me to Accra. <laughs> Ten and a half hours on the road. I mean, I arrived at the hospital in, in Accra and nobody could believe that I actually made it. And they did the best they could do, um, but it didn't work. Six weeks in high dependency uh, unit, I had to be evacuated again, medical evacuation. As an African international officer, my point of evacuation would have been to South Africa. At this time, my husband was in Switzerland said, no, we don't know anybody in South Africa evacuate to Switzerland. So that's how I got to Switzerland and had a second surgery this time in Switzerland on the lungs. And the doctors just told me that, look, they're just going to keep managing this situation. There is absolutely no situation, uh, solution to it. And that was what I had to do again, manage the situation. Then 2008, um, they told me that they have exhausted. I mean, 2007, I was in Cairo this time. Um, at this time, with the dust, with the heat, my lungs just really gave up again. And I couldn't hold enough ox you know, air to give me sufficient oxygen. And so I became oxygen dependent. I had to have external supply of oxygen. So oxygen in the office, a kind of oxygen to hold between my home. And then I had oxygen concentrator in the house. And so I could only stay three months longer to finish the project. I had to shut it down my career for the second time shut down my career and then came back to Switzerland to continue to manage my health in 2008. And then at uh, 2010, the doctors told me they have exhausted all medical options. And the only solution left was for me to have a lung transplant. <laughs> I, mean, when they, when, I remember when the doctor said it to me and I just looked at to my husband and like, it was as if they told me I was going for an X-ray. I was, I did not even make any response. I just got up and laughed. It was when I got home that it dawned on me. You know what lung transplant means? For lungs, somebody, like it can be a live donor. Somebody is going to die for me to leave. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. How do you pray that somebody should die for you to leave? That was very difficult for me to deal with. Ultimately, I got a word of assurance in Isaiah 43 
and says to me that because you're precious in my sight and I've loved you, I give men for your sake. And so what I did I to do from then on was to start praying for the person who was going to have to die for me to leave. And that was what we did. I was on the waiting list until 2013 when I eventually had the surgery and um, the old diseased lungs were taken out and a new set of lungs were given to me. And that's how I have a lung transplant. And I survived because um, that's another long story. I, um, I developed complications. I started rejecting the lungs immediately after the surgery. 12 hours, my system started shutting down and the doctors had to put me on medically induced coma. And while I was in coma, I was told that I was on dialysis. I was on heart lung machine on life support um, throughout the period. And it was in that process that I had insufficient blood supply to my hands and to my legs. And they told my husband that to save my life, they have to amputate both hands and both legs. And my husband refused to give them permission to do so. That um, if I come back, we will take that decision together. If I don't, I'll be going home with my limbs. <laughs> so I came back five weeks in, after com in, in coma. And that was um, the news they gave me that I got strong lungs. However, both my legs and my hands will have to be amputated. I just so I'm done. I want to go back home. I, I'm not doing this. <laughs> well, here we are today. Yes. I submitted to the will of God because he promised me he would give me the feet of grace that would take me to places my natural feet would not have taken me. So two weeks after I came out of coma, I was back in the theater again, and both legs were amputated below the knees. And... Um, my hands began to make a recovery and we spent the next three months uh, removing the dead tissues from my hands. I lost all my nails and uh, had to grow them back again. I hear myself. I well, said, so can you just husband. do this? <laughs> okay, now, I, I, just because I want you guys to see that she, she does love her nails. You know? I love my nails. <laughs> I take good care of my nails. <laughs> if, if I had my chance when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a finger model. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I had said when I was writing about um, the promo for um, this uh, conversation was that um, Ariel has a great sense of humor. And... Um, <laughs> I remember, I think the last time I saw you, sis, I came to hug you. I mean, to say bye-bye, I was leaving. And I came to hug you and you said, well, Gina, as you can see, I can't jump into my, my feet, my legs. So you'll just have to come, you know. And, well, I was on my bed. I couldn't jump into my legs, so you had to come closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, sis, you got to learn to make lights this weight. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be able to, we don't have emotional bandwidth to deal with such things if we don't make light of it. It's pretty heavy, but I've had to yes. make that weight a bit lighter for myself. Yeah. <laughs> because this has been like, you just think you've gotten over one obstacle and then another one comes and another one comes and another one comes and another one comes. And Hmm. How? How do you cope? How do you get over? I know the word overcomer is not like, oh, I overcame. It is, yeah. I think it's a present. <laughs> if you continue to overcome. You continue to overcome, you know. And I, I'd like to, you to just speak about it because you said you've made a choice not to exist you wanted to live and you wanted to mm -hmm. live well you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what does living um, well mean to you what does that mean to you and how how do you get to that point um okay for me um i think the first thing was having a word to anchor on and um it was very interesting how that anchor came for me it was way back in 1984 it was exactly three months after I gave my life to Christ. I was born in a religious home. Church was what we do. Reading the Bible was what we do. But I didn't have a personal relationship with God. And um, 
I, I, I couldn't wait to go into the university. As soon as I got into the university, I did my own thing. I mean, believe me, the girl did her own thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. And two weeks mm -hmm. in between all of that, um, God caught my attention. And he did it in a very nice, in a very fantastic way. He didn't let me sleep until I went on my knees and just said, okay, God, take over. And when I did that, I knew I was on vacation from the university and we were going back to school. I knew the life I left in school and I knew what was waiting for me. And I knew that there was no way I could continue in the circle where I was. So I was really devouring my Bible. Now I was reading the Bible for myself. It wasn't something my mother was reading to us. My father was reading to us. I, you know, and um, it was in the process of reading. I was just, just wanted to study the New Testament and was going through that. I was at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, just literally leaped out of the Bible and latched itself on my spirit. I read it. It didn't make any sense to me. I mean, three months old in the Lord, what is the God comforting us in all our afflictions with the same comfort with which you comfort of that? What was all of that? But fast forward to 86, I had a major um, uh, health challenge. I, had, I was doing my youth service and um, I thought it was malaria. I was in Badegi in Niger State and all the way traveling from Badegi to Ibadan. This, the, the car had to, the taxi had to stop several times for me to throw up until I started throwing up back. And at one point before we got to Ilori, the taxi driver was going to leave me by the roadside. He was tired of stopping. And all the passengers had to scream. So by the time I got home, got into the hospital, they really couldn't know what was going on in the private clinic. Eventually I landed in Luz. And it was in Luz that they told me, the doctor who, did, after they stabilized the situation, um, gave three pints of blood and made a diagnosis. And the doctor, the house officer who was taking the diagnosis, you know, just came and asked about my, I mean, taking history that, did you notice a pattern? I thought, if he had said, did you notice a pattern? I would have been, okay, okay, I understand. But he just said to me, see you in hospital in six years, in 1992, this was 1986. And I said, I beg your pardon. I said, haven't you seen a pattern? If you take your medical history, every six years, you have a major medical event. So that took me, caught me unawares and I'm like, what is this all about? So I really, really was praying about what is going on here. And at this time, this word kept coming back to me. I will comfort you in all your afflictions with the same comfort you will comfort others. Of course, I got married in 1992. I was quite sensitive about what I had heard. And I was, I mean, I said, this thing is over. I know hospital for me in 1992, it's all joy for us. I got pregnant. Even though we had planned that we're going to wait two years, I got pregnant six weeks after I got pregnant, I got married. And then to now have a stillbirth in January 1993, it was really, I mean, it, 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 it shook my world at, you know, at its very foundation. But this is what came back to me solidly. And so having that word at that point, it was like, this is not just about me. This is about the comfort that I was going to get in every situation and to be able to comfort others. And so that helped me to change my posture, knowing that they say there's something more to what was going on with me. It wasn't just all about me. So that early on, I had gotten that truth. And so when this happened and that work comes back to me, it's like, Irene, you've got to process this and you've got to get comfort and out of this. It's not just about you. It's going to mean something to somebody along the way. So it helped me to make a choice that I'm going to leave. It helped me to choose how I posture myself when the pain is really severe. And at the beginning, I never thought it was really going to get this bad, this intense. But the worse it was becoming, the more I had to remind myself that it's not about me. Sometimes I'm on the floor groaning in pain and all I can say to myself is that, you know, you're going to have to share a testimony about this someday. What are you going to say? So what are you going to do to stabilize you in this moment? I have to just have to say that it didn't reduce the pain, but it gave purpose to the pain. It gave me a reason to keep going through. It gave me something to look forward to that someday all of this will add up. How it was gonna add up, I don't know. 
I didn't know then. And I guess now I'm getting a glimpse of how it's all adding up. But having that anchor helped me to look beyond the pain into a future that all of that, what I was going through was going to become meaningful. You know, as you were just talking, I, I I thought about many of I mean, we've all gone through different things. I mean, I will not minimize anyone's pain. Everyone's pain is pain, you know. Difficult yes. situations are difficult situations. And we have different capacities to, and abilities to handle pain. But I'm just thinking that, I mean, for someone like me, I used to think, once you get over a situation, it's done and dusted. It's not coming back, you know. But but things have come back in my life. And what you said, be sensitive to patterns, what your doctor said, be sensitive to patterns. I had um, an uncle who had a stroke, you know. Um, my mother had a stroke. And then my... my um, Husband recently had a stroke. Mm. And in two cases, I was a caregiver, not in my uncle's own, but I I just used to go with my mom to see, this is her brother. And mm. just wonder, mm. like, this man was so strong and so vibrant. Mm. Oh my goodness, is this how life is? You know, so it's just to say, maybe to encourage all of us out here that it, it may never stop. But mm -hmm. what could stop us? What could stop us is our our sense that this is too much. How mm -hmm. would it be too mm -hmm. much? Yeah, when people are mm -hmm. going through and going through mm -hmm. and going through and not mm -hmm. sharing their stories. Many people don't share their stories, it's just shut, shut down. But sis, I want yes. to ask them, yeah. how how did you um how did you avoid depression? Huh, how did I avoid depression? <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I cannot say that I I was deliberately looking for a way to avoid depression. All right. Um and in my time, depression is not a word that we throw about the way we throw it around today. Yes. But one thing that was on my mind was pity party, yeah. right? Everybody who knew me very well, all my close friends knew that I don't do pity party. And I don't allow people to do it with me. And I don't go to anybody's pity party because I feel that that makes me a victim. Yeah. All right. And I could not afford to have a victim mentality in this because I felt that that would be limiting. If I think that I was a victim, that I would lose the impetus to fight this battle if I already given up. And it would make it difficult for me to tap into the grace that could empower me because I knew that God's grace empowers us to, and it equips us to be able to go through challenges. And I also came from a background where I think my upbringing as a Christian, as a young Christian, we were told that suffering will happen to us. We, the theology that uh, suffering is not part of Christianity was not part of my upbringing in the in the in in the in, um, in um, student inter university in the intervarsity union that I was. I've seen you in in in, in UI. We know that challenges will come. We were trained to take it in our stride to learn from it. So I think with all of that, um, for me, it was not a conscious avoidance or a conscious prevention of de de depression. It was on the other side, seeing how I can keep myself stable on the anchors that I had. I remembered when I had the amputation, I mean, the word where I had been um, treated for my uh, respiratory disease, I had been a constant visitor on that word 10 years. I'm there at least three, four times in a year 
on that word. So I knew everybody. All the nurses know me, they knew me. <laughs> now, when they were bringing me back from the ICU after I had the long, uh, the long, first, I had a long transplant in another hospital, which is the center for that particular type of uh, transplant. They brought me back to my own hospital, but took me to ICU. And then they did the, uh, the amputation in my own hospital. So at the end of the day, they took me from the ICU back to my ward, eighth floor in the um, university hospital. The nurses were lining the corridor when they brought me in. Everybody weeping. And the word was, what has leg got to do with lungs? How did lungs become amputation? So you could see their pain on my behalf. And they came to me. They said, you should be angry. You should be depressed. I said, which one? Choose one. Angry or depressed? <laughs> you should ask for an inquest. <laughs> Everybody was <laughs> suggesting what, how they felt that I should handle the situation. It got to a point that they actually invited a psychiatrist to come and see me. That mm -hmm. I was not, I was in denial, that I wasn't processing the situation. That how can somebody yeah. have lung transplant and amputation and be calm? One night, one of the longest nurses that had done me came to me and said, look, even if you can't talk to any other nurse or doctor, I've known you the longest. You should be able to talk to me. Why are you just quiet? <laughs> so I said to her in French, Je décide depuis longtemps que je ne jamais renoncer l'espoir. Because it's a French culture. And what it means is that I had decided a long time ago that I will never give up on hope. That it's not that I cannot talk to you, but what are you going to do when I finish talking to you? Yeah. What difference is it going to make to the situation? When I weep to you, what are you going to do? You will tell me sorry and you will go. I said, I do weep, but I weep and cry out to the one who can make a difference for me. I said that the night when you all go, I turn my face to the wall and I cry out to my God, how did we get to, to this point? Amputation, yeah. to this point. And that is where I can get comfort. I said, you don't understand it, but I just want you to know that I, I got this. I still as if I got it in my own strength. I have a God who has promised me something will come out of this. So they called the psychiatrist, I asked them to call the psychiatric back that take. They had put antidepressant as part of my medication. And I had to ask him, I mean, 14 medications already, don't add the 15th one on it. Can you please take out this tiny thing? She said, just my, use it to hope that I don't need an antidepressant. Take it out. And I repeated to her as well. Je décide depuis longtemps que je ne jamais renoncer l'espoir. I won't give up on hope that something Will come out of this. You don't understand it, but I understand what I'm dealing with. That's how I dealt with it. I don't. Um, I don't know if I, that answered your question well, but I. It, depression was not part of the equation for me. Well, it answers the question very well. It takes segues very neatly into the next thing I I'd like to talk to, and I want to put this up on the screen. Um, my sister, my friend Irene, can be found on um, Instagram. I think Facebook as well, but definitely Instagram yeah. at the um, Feet of Grace Foundation. And she, I think the first time she met me, she gave me a beautiful, a beautiful, so that's a bangle, a bracelet. Yes, a bracelet. <laughs> yes, it's a bracelet. And the second time she met me, she gave me another one. So I have two. You know, I know you asked me, have you given me one before? I said, yes. She said, no, I have this one. Too. <laughs> so I have two beautiful bangles. And that's what she started doing, the Fits of Grace Foundation. Well, Fits of Grace Foundation has has moved on beyond that. But I'd like to, um, sister, you have a, is that an audio copy of this book? Not yet. Everybody is telling me not to do yet. an audio. I think I have to do an audio. There's not audio yet. Yes. <laughs> Since we, we, I would like, you know, for my personal purpose, not for me, I like to read physical books, but I think my husband and many other people who 
are probably going through. Yes. You know, and especially I think for men who, I think men process pain in a different way. Because mm, some, somehow we have yeah. we have our sisters with us and we, we can talk about things. But men yeah. kind of process pain in silence, in this stoic silence. And it should be nice for him mm. to just listen. And um, <laughs> I don't have to be there. He can listen and yeah. make what he wants. So please, I'm, I'm in that group of people who are saying, please do um, the, uh, the audio. <laughs> okay, book. do yeah. an audio. I think we have yeah. more than enough witnesses now that an audio is going to be needful. And, um, and a few people have asked me about it. And so I'm going to have to pay attention to doing that, you know, as soon as we can. Yeah. yeah. And um, yes, the Feet of Grace Foundation is the charity component. Uh, there's also the Beyond the Pain. Uh, the Feet of Grace Foundation deals with, um, well, the instruction was two for me, enrich lives and inspire hope. So with the Feet of Grace Foundation, we enrich lives of amputees. So Feet of Grace Foundation raises funds to provide uh, prosthetic limbs, scholarships, um, seed funds for women and children with missing limbs. Um, the idea is that um, once we can get them you know, mobilized again, they can regain their autonomy and make contributions to the society and to their families. So um, that's part of the buyers that we have to deal with. Um, you're a woman yes. and you're a woman with disability, it's double biases so, that we have to deal with. On the other side is Beyond the Pain, which is a, a training and a coaching service that helps people, individuals, to go through their own painful experiences and discover purpose through it. Basically, the idea for me is that if you don't process your pain, you will waste your pain. And you will waste your pain. Your pain will be in vain if it does not serve as a gain for somebody else. Your pain will be in vain if somebody else does not benefit it. Your pain will be from it, from what you have brought out of it. And it will be in vain if it does not bring glory to God by advancing his kingdom. And so the training and the coaching is to help people transform their pain to power, to purpose, and to profit. And that's why um, the Beyond the Pain, I have a Purpose Beyond the Pain on IG as well and on um, Facebook where I teach and help people to walk through their traumatic experiences and bring out something. I mean, for me, I felt that it would be a double tragedy for me to go through 20 plus years of one incident after the other and after the yeah. other and after the other, and it does not add up for something that would be of eternal value. It would be a, a, a double tragedy it would be a waste for me. And I be, it's so mattered to me to see people transform what could have broken them, what could have been the end of them into something powerful, something purposeful, something that brings hope to others. So those are the two um, areas that I focus on. And that's why the boot camp is happening. The training as a profit of pain training is starting on Saturday. It's going to be 10 weeks um, of weekly um, live sessions a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me and a mentoring as well. So that's going to start on Saturday. And then for the Feet of Grace Foundation, we're going to be having the charity works in different yeah. parts of the world. So we're asking everybody to join us because the only way we can give the limbs to these women and girls is when people make donations to the Feet of Grace Foundation. So the charity work is going to start from April 16th and uh, between April 16th and uh, June 30th, 30th and everybody in different cities can join us, pick a date, work with us, and ask your friends to support your work. This is how we raise funds for the work of the foundation. The foundation is a charity organization. Yeah. Okay, so it was a fit of, um, they hit the streets that I was going to talk about yes. as well. Yes, yes. Yes, I was, yes. I was going to talk about that, and then let me just put it up there. Um, I have committed, and uh, anybody who knows me, even a quarter of the way, you'll know that I'm the most famous couch potato. You know? <laughs> <laughs> most famous couch potato. But I have promised last last year I couldn't do it because um, my yeah. husband was in the was dealing with the uh, they all the whole family was dealing with the trauma of the stroke, etc. Yes. You know, yes. yes. 
this year I have committed to doing it. You mm -hmm. see, has been wrangled into doing it. <laughs> and um, and we're getting we're getting three t-shirts. And we're going to do it since it's between April and June. We'll do it before the rains hit, but maybe yes. it'll, it will have rained a little bit so we can we can go some distance. So if you're in Port Harcourt or in your city mm -hmm. and you'd like to get a t-shirt, it, it costs five thousand naira minus delivery. You know, so yeah. you please let me know. I will I will hook you up with the person who who will then give you all the information. And if yeah. you would like to sponsor me like i said couch potato <laughs> but we are raising funds for women who don't want you know let's go back to let's let's look back to the question walking without legs how do you walk without legs? By well how do i work with that <laughs> how, how do i work without legs yeah well i'll, I'll tell you quickly she's my friend yeah <laughs> she can go faster and further than you know call irene on any given day and she's probably done by 11 o'clock she's probably done like 10 things that you're just thinking oh what would i do with my day <laughs> you know? and she's already moved she's already moved on you know so if you'd like to support me support you see we are going to get the t-shirts anyway if you want the t-shirts let me know but if you'd like to sponsor us the funds will all go back to um, the feet of grace foundation you know, mm -hmm. Oh, and you can pay straight there. You can pay straight in there. You know. <laughs> so, since how have you been able to walk without work? Because I know you're a trauma and transformational coach, and you did tell me that there's a difference between pain and trauma, but we didn't mm -hmm. dig into it. Mm -hmm. can, can can you talk about it? Okay, let me start with the first question: How do I walk without legs? Thankfully, I have my prosthetic limbs, right? I have two of them. I have two pairs of my prosthetic limbs. I have the one that I can wear high heels with, and I have the ones that I wear my sports shoes with. So <laughs> I, it depends on what I'm doing, where I'm going, that I, this, uh, which leg do I wear. Now, See, sorry, I have to stop you. I have to stop you because I have to report to you. She insisted, this lady, <laughs> Coiled with the prosthetic link maker that she did she liked to wear high heels and she needed a heel on prosthetic <laughs> you know. So she has one with some really, some really cool trainers, and then she has one with, with a really nice heel, you know. So oh they say thank you, you for a sponsor. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. It was very interesting what I told my um my my prosthetician that. I don't wear flat shoes. And that's really the truth. I don't wear flat shoes because I walk like a duck when I wear flat shoes. So all my work shoes, my outer shoes, you know, have some heels. So when I told him that he said, you are a bilateral amputee, you need stability. You cannot start with height. You, if, if anything happens, you're going to fall. So we had a long debate about it. So he eventually at the first gave me about um, one and a half centimeters, you know, and so well, that is better than flat. But ultimately, I now have the flat one, and I also have. I mean, after using that for a few, a couple of years, I realized that it wasn't even, <laughs> it was not comfortable on my back as well to always be on a, you know. So I get, I, I have, I could go up to three centimeters. So I was constantly on three centimeters, even walking around the house. So I, I mean, nobody had to tell me before I went to go the, for the flat one as well because I needed to be able to wear canvases and slippers around the house. Now, my legs, I call them my feet of grace. They help me to do the things that I need to do. My first instruction was to own them because the first time I saw my prosthetic limbs, I hated them outright. I couldn't believe for the life of me that this was going to be my life, wearing this metal. But thank God, um, grace prevailed. It was, it's well covered. If I don't tell you at times that it's artificial, you don't know my story, you wouldn't know. But and now I'm not even, I've passed that stage. I can wear my metal anywhere. I'm not defined by my disability. I'm defined by my true identity in God. And what I bring to the table tells more about me than my, you know, that, than my disability. But my disability has become an opportunity to be able to reach out to people, right? So I do my work. I have um, my agenda, my schedule. I try to, I, I mean, because for me, before, before I can get out of bed, 
I need to have, I mean, if I don't have my wheelchair with me, I need to put on my legs. And if where you have to dash the bathroom and you have to think about putting, first of all, the process, two legs, and it's not as if I'm just going to stick my leg, my stumps straight into the legs. I have to cover it with a silicone, put another socks on it to buffer it before I put it into the, into the legs. So I try to do as much as possible in the mornings before I have to, you know, put on my legs. So, because once I go to do my shower and I come out, I'm, I'm in my legs. And then I'm, I'm, I can move all over the place, especially when I'm traveling and I don't have my wheelchair with me. If I have my wheelchair with me, I will take my time because, I mean, I just want to get as much things done. And um, I'm able to walk from home. I mean, I was already used to walking from home all the years that I couldn't, be, you know, walk again from um, in my regular profession. I have a system that helps me to do everything that I do. I mean, COVID has shown us that it's possible to work from home. I can be at home if I don't have a speaking engagement or a hospital appointment. I can, I, I may not leave my door for two weeks, except I'm going to church. All right. So I have a good system to be able to do that, and that works for me. So I do a lot without my natural legs. But with my artificial limbs, I can go as far as I want. I can go anywhere I want. I, I'm well adjusted to my legs we we have a synchrony together we do well together and it also tells me when it's time for me to stop when i'm talking too much standing it begins to hurt i have to sit down when i'm ministering when my legs begin to twitch, i know that it's time for me to sit down. so it sends me messages as well so i have a very good relationship with my prosthetic limbs i call them the feet of grace and they have really been very graceful to me now, pain and trauma. Trauma is something that happens to you that overwhelms your ability to, 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 to uh, cope with it. And the myth in that moment, anything that happens to you that overwhelms you is a traumatic event. And trauma leads to pain. So you could say your painful experience is also a traumatic event. What happens is that it causes pain. We need to process that pain caused by trauma or uh, events or experiences in our lives that overwhelms us. And trauma can be primary, it could be secondary. It could be group trauma. All of us in the world today, we're going through the trauma of COVID. We're going through the trauma of the wars. It is affecting us in an insidious way. And we are not mindful of its impact on us. And how are we protecting ourselves and taking care of ourselves against this insidious trauma, silent trauma? In Nigeria today, with all that is happening, with the, with the no, no, no electricity, the financial situation, there is a trauma that we are all experiencing as a nation. It is impacting us. And the part of the consequences that we are seeing is people becoming pain deaf. And pain death means that you are becoming numb to things that should shock you. We are finding it difficult to empathize with people when things happen to them. It's become cosera sera. We are taking things in our strides that we should not be taking in our strides. On the short term, in the temporary, it might, the denial may help us to bring our, give ourselves the opportunity to absorb the shock. But we must get to a point of acceptance. This is wrong. What happened is not right. What am I going to do with this situation? And trauma could happen from physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, being bullied, working in a toxic uh, uh, environment, and it could be an accident. I mean, health challenges, these are all traumatic events. The long and short of it is that they cause emotional pain, than they cause physical pain. And the point is, how do we, what do we do with the pain? Our natural tendency is to numb it, run away from it, deny it. But my position is, what if we embrace pain? F take the bull in the, in the by its horn, face it, and say, what am I going to do with it? It is when we process the pain, that we reframe it with the perspective of what it can deliver, 
as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to grow, that is where we can repurpose it. And that's where we can discover the power in pain, the purpose of it, and the profit it can deliver, not only to ourselves, but to others in our sphere of influence. Ultimately, God uses all our challenges and our situations and he uses it for his glory. My point is, how can you use your event to advance God's kingdom and for the, his glory? How can you use your traumatic events, your painful events, to bring hope to others so that you deny that pain, the power to redefine your present you. and determine yeah. how you transact in the future? Because the pain that we do not deal with, the pain in our past, the pain in the present that we do not deal with, it will ooze out in our future relationships. It festers and it will ooze out. So what power do I want to give my pain? The one to redefine my life negatively or the power to do something good, something meaningful and something significant that will benefit others and ultimately bring glory to God. Thank you, sis. Thank you so much. Um, every time, I think it's not just when I listen to you, I just like to watch you. I just like to watch you. I just like to sit with you and watch you. And uh, <laughs> we're just hanging out and uh, you're just doing things. And uh, I'm seeing you get over. And then uh, let's say in coaching, that's what we're taught that a lot more is caught than taught. And I so, catch a lot. I catch yeah. a lot from just sitting with you, not even asking you any specific question. But listening to you and watching you yes and um yes um, not only is she married to what i call a tall dark handsome man you know yeah my fine dude <laughs> yes yes she has who does not soldiers. know that he's becoming an old man <laughs> yeah no still you on your own no <laughs> no dr peter is not an old man <laughs> it's my fine young man and yeah, my friends asked is. me what i did that to freeze him at 25. So when he, when he was 25, yeah. I froze him. So he still had yeah. the same stature as 25. <laughs> yeah. And she also has two soldiers, two, two young men who are standing yeah. to her right and left. And her husband is right there as a bulwark. <laughs> yes. So, um, um, yes, I, I, I think for me, the biggest bias, when, when I started this conversation, I thought the biggest bias was, was um, how to... Um, get over walking with the legs, but it's also, I think what it is, is really getting over the bias in your mind. Those yes. self-limiting beliefs, mm -hmm, you know, those things mm -hmm, that tell mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. I am the label. You can't. People say, people <laughs> say this is who I am, so I can't. And the, there's, there's, a, there's a quote here, but I need to, I need to write it because we have- I can't cannot be my default. <laughs> I, uh, no, you said it more, you said it more, more, I cannot, Cannot, I cannot, cannot be my default, be my default mode. No, default no, mode. it cannot be. Yes. Because um, those limiting mindsets, and honestly, this is what this transformation, that's the transformation I want to bring to people. That shift in the mindset, that, the, that your afflictions do not need to define you. Yes. An event happened to you. It happened to me. It cannot be me. I have the power and the grace to choose what I do with what happened to me. I may not have control over what happened to me, but I certainly do have the control over what I do with it, how I respond to it. I can choose to react to it and I can choose to respond to it. I can see it as an opportunity to learn and to grow. And otherwise it's going to leave me depressed discourage and push me into the precipice of despair. No, it's and double frozen, tragedy. Sis, and frozen. Many people are frozen. Yes. Frozen. Yes. And that's why and I said all, we are becoming yeah. pain deaf. We are becoming yes. frozen. Things are not shocking us anymore because we've we've seen it. We've had it. But that it's not a healthy way. It's not a healthy place to be. We need to talk about the trauma. We need to talk about the pain. And we need to talk about what we do with that beyond the pain. What can I bring out of this experience? How would I 
make a difference with my story. I can't waste my pain. Don't waste your pain. Whatever it is that you have gone through, you can repossess it. You can repurpose it. But it takes determination. It takes an intentionality. It takes being relentless that no, one death cannot kill me twice. It mm -hmm. don't, it, uh -uh. No, it's, it's, it's double jeopardy. One death cannot kill you twice. It's bad enough that this thing has happened to you. What are you going to do with it? Is it going to be the end of your story or is it just going to be one chapter in the book of your life? Of your life. Okay, guys, so um, Sister Irene, we are at the end of our hour and um, it always ends so quickly. You know, especially <laughs> when I'm in the company of my sisters. It's, it's so fun. <laughs> guys, you can get this book. This book is amazing. It yes. is amazing. And she has another one. Which is 55, 55 chapters. chapters. 55 of chapters of grace and hope. Of grace, of grace and hope. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten that yet. I will, I will get it. Yes, I wanted to get the t-shirts and everything together. Being Please with walk you, with uh, us in your cities, not just yes, in Kodakot. Walk with you us. You can get, yes, I, and I'm going to keep <laughs> with the information. Elvira, thank you. You can't see. Elvira, what can't you see? <laughs> Okay, um, you can get it at Feet of Grace Foundation. I need to let um, Sister Irene, I call her Sister Irene because she's my my sister, even though she's my Aburu. But she's yes, my I'm sister. your Aburu. <laughs> she's my Aburu. You know? Yeah, my big but sister. I yeah, I love her to pieces. And um, <laughs> guys, it's called Feet of Grace. Okay, the book, I'm sorry, it's called, I, I'm going to put it The here. book is great the in the grace. storm. Grace in the storm. Grace in the storms, a living proof. And the foundation is on social media, Feet of Grace Foundation. And we have Grace information the about the work there. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Somebody asked, uh, asked uh, are they on Amazon? Yes, it's on Amazon. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And this is the IG um, Feet of Grace. Okay. <laughs> I think I just put IF. Feet of Grace. <laughs> Yes. It's of Grace Foundation. Is foundation. it just of Grace Foundation? It's Fit of Grace Foundation, yes. On I, and forgive, on IG on my, Facebook. Forgive my typing. It's all it's in lower the, you, you know when you go on IG, you 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 <laughs> you know, you know. But thank you so much, sis. Thank you. This has been for me it's been a another <laughs> it's added another layer of strength and mm. uh, purpose to me and uh, I hope it has for all of you who have um, I hope so too. stayed I with hope us. So too. Thank you so much. I need to say Thank bye bye first to, to our friends on, on Instagram before we get popped off. So thank you so much for staying with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and on um, and on Facebook, thank you so much. You guys thank make you. it so worthwhile for us to come. <laughs> every week and you come and support us here thank you yes. very much next week we are rounding up um uh homage to an exploration of international women's day which is break the bias we have indeed um, talked about many biases and next mm. week we're going to talk to someone about woman the brand it's going to be very interesting trust me i'm a branding person so i i have like my questions are like that, that, that much. You know? <laughs> so thank you. Please join us thank next week. Thank you so much. Everyone yes. will join. Thank you. Next. Join us next time. Say, 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 see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Bring those chocolates. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will be in for Lagos charity work. Yes. I oh, will. fantastic. Okay. Yes, yes, thank yes. you. Bye-bye. Yes. God bless yes. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>